Hey everyone. So over the past couple years, I've been working on a project called Iceberg. If you've been hanging out in the Twitch streams, then you're probably very familiar with this. Oh. Oh. However, for anyone who's not familiar with Iceberg, I wanted to create a couple videos explaining what it is and why I think it's so useful. So essentially at its core, Iceberg is a library. A lot of libraries either provide one very specific implementation or a set of generic global utility functions. But I wanted Iceberg to be something more than that. I wanted it to be a foundation that I could come to rely upon and to build all of my future projects up off of. And so because of that, I knew that it had to do more than just provide miscellaneous utilities. It had to establish standards and design patterns that I could come to rely upon as I was working on the project. And especially when it comes to large, complex, interconnected systems, there is a lot to be desired from the game maker side of things. My goal was to create a library that filled those holes, that allowed me to do things quickly and easily. So let's take a look at Iceberg. I'm going to open this project I've been working on. And in the top, you can see that Iceberg is the first folder here. If I expand this folder, I want to pay attention to four major parts. Systems, utilities, resources, templates. Systems and utilities belong to the internal folder and therefore have to be accessed through the Iceberg object itself. For example, if I want to get a utility, I would say Iceberg get utility and pass in the utility that I would like to get before accessing any of its internal methods. However, resources and templates are designed to be utilized totally outside of the iceberg object. These are constructors and objects that we can instantiate without needing to worry about going through iceberg. The idea here is that these are standalone components that should be used for any and every project. Before diving into any of these though, we first need to take a step back and discuss the first major topic of the iceberg series. To do this, I'm going to create an inventory system. And this is what I will use as a playground for demonstrating some of the different tips and tricks that we will be using inside of Iceberg. The first topic we're gonna to discuss is visibility. How many times have you opened up an object and just been hit with a wall of variables? Variables that control movement, visuals, particles, sound effects, stats, maybe saving and loading. You open it up and see hundreds of variables and have no idea what it is that you're supposed to touch what it is you're even allowed to modify, or where you're even supposed to begin. This is why visibility or encapsulation is so important. A lot of the times, variables that are internal to the system don't ever really need to be accessed by anybody using the system or from outside of the system. So having all of this immediately visible when we open up this object can be very confusing and misleading to the user. Because of this, we want a way to hide internal variables and expose very important variables. We want the non-important variables to be hidden and we want the important variables to be immediately visible. This way, whenever anyone opens up the system, they can see immediately what it is that they are allowed to work with and what they are allowed to modify. In order to accomplish this, we are going to implement private variables. This is a concept seen in many other programming languages in which private variables are only accessible internally to the system itself and external members cannot access these variables. I'm going to create a struct called double underscore. This will represent our private variables. Inside of this struct, I'm going to declare the width and height of our inventory. Here I have just declared a width and height of two and nested it within this private struct. Now, nothing about this makes these technically private variables. I can still access them from outside of the system However, by nesting them within this obscurely named struct, it becomes more tedious to access these members. So instead, I'm going to make it very easy to access them the way that I want users to access them. I'm going to create a method called get width and get height. And now inside of this, I'm going to say return private width and return private height. This is very similar to the Java syntax in which we create getters and setters for all of our internal members that we need to access publicly. And what's nice about this is if I collapse this and open it up, I can see right away, I have this private block 
that as a user, I may not even need to dig into, but right away, I can see that I can access the width and the height using these two methods. So all of our public functionality is going to be siphoned through methods attached to the object. Instead of thinking of our code as instance destroy obj player, Instead, we're going to think of it as obj player dot destroy, in which we are invoking methods on our objects. By doing this, we can very clearly distinguish what is allowed and what is not allowed. If there is a method for it, it is allowed. If there is not a method for it, it is not allowed. And lastly, to tie this off, I'm going to create two additional methods called set width and set height. In which I will say, private width is equal to our incoming width, private height is equal to our incoming height. I will also finish this off by returning self, and this is a topic I will get into in a further video. Steve it.